I'll start. I think I'll start talking now. I'm always trying to figure out when this starts. And it uh, looks like our, we're live on on uh, Facebook, and uh, we're uh, we're on our way here towards uh, doing a program. Hello there. This is our uh, little Monday get together, and uh, I, I say hello to all of you uh, because it's nice to uh, nice to have you here. Anyway, uh, we have a lot of people waiting to go on, and if you want to join us. Just go to uh, gabnet.net. Over the right-hand side of the page, there is a thing that says uh, click here to be on Zoom. You just click that, and it'll automatically allow you to Zoom. Okay? All right? Okay. All right. Hmm. My crooked teeth are showing up today. Why, why more than usual? Hmm. I had those fixed years ago. I didn't have them fixed. I had them. Uh, they did a, a, a thing where they put in... I don't know, some kind of veneers or something, but I think they've worn out. I have this one tooth here. I, I probably should have had it replaced a long time ago. If I just pulled that one tooth, all the other teeth would look fine. No, I don't know. I was always afraid to do it. I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, I'm in broadcasting, as you know, or I was. Okay. And the way I speak, and the way any of you speak out there, is dependent upon the dentalization of your speaking. In other words, your tongue uh, against the, the teeth and so on and so forth. So consequently, I didn't want to have that pulled because I felt it might change the way I speak. So I haven't, I haven't done it over the years. My parents should have done it a long time ago when I was a kid and put braces, but no, they didn't do that. Anyway, let's let some of these people in here. There, there's Shecky, and there's uh, Andrew Deutsch, and Steve Bender. Hi, Steve. Uh, there's Charlie Walls. Mike Chisholm is uh, going to be in here any moment, and uh, Len LaFrisco has just joined us. Hello, gang. How are you? Good. Huh? Wait. All so good. Oh, okay. Just say something. <laughs> so Fine. Oh, yeah, we're doing good. I just saw Shecky on Saturday, and we uh, we went out and we had, I had the, the pad, pad tie, which I... But you had the combo pad tie. And I had the combo? Yeah, you had pork and beef. No, I didn't. You did. No, you did. <laughs> no, you did. I just took the I one I had ball. beef pad tie. You ordered beef and said, oh... What about pork? And she goes, or the guy goes, do you want a combination? And you said, yes. Oh, oh, the combination. I see. And then they brought me this big bowl. I should have really ordered the all in. What is the thing? The, the, the special, lunch special. The lunch special, because then it was just the right amount of pad thai. Instead, it was a huge amount of pad thai. Which you ate all of. Huh? <laughs> Which I ate, ate every inch of. Yeah. 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 I said, so. you could probably take it home, but, you know. I hear I have a Mike Chisholm here, and he's not on, so let me get rid of him. Uh, b b remove this one, okay? And I hope it Sorry doesn't remove that. Him. Uh, What? There Technical difficulty on my end. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, because what happened was somehow you did s come in here. You know, you were uh, online, but it went cattywampus on you. This I had no audio. I could see all of your beautiful faces, but could not hear a damn thing. So I came back and seen things seem to be uh, closer, as close to normal as can be. So, oh, okay. You Where for... are you? You look like you're in a basement or something. Oh my God, you are so perceptive. I am in the bedroom that I grew up in for the first 19 years, 20 years of my life before I bought my first apartment. This well... is my old bedroom. Oh really? Well, say say hello to Shecky. He's in his old bedroom, which <laughs> which has remained oh, his bedroom all these years. I got to tell you, I connect with Shecky on so many levels because we're both collectors of things, just maybe from different eras a little bit. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I love Rick so much. I've, I'm surrounded by a bunch of the things that my parents are good enough to store for me. Many of them being collectibles that are that, far, that, that, far that doesn't look like stored. That looks like dumped. <laughs> the line between store and hoarder is if your parents are keeping it. Uh -oh. <laughs> That's a fair point. That's a fair well, point. Alex, Alex, you're a techno guy, right? Yeah. So, that is a 
a, a car audio, obviously, mini disc player. Remember the mini disc? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where you could actually record on a mini disc and override it and all that. That's an yeah. actual audio uh, system for a vehicle. Why do I still fucking have this? Well, I don't. Uh, because you can't throw it away. It's, it's a collector's item. Can I refer you back to my previous comment? <laughs> I, know, but I, was throwing away, I was throwing away stuff in the guest room, you know, because of the, it's become the catch all for all our stuff. And um, I found this long screw, but I have no idea what it went to. It's just a long screw. It was probably <laughs> worth a thousand dollars. So I, I haven't had one of those for a while. So I saved it. <laughs> well, now, Shecky, I don't know. I don't know how to describe Shecky. Shecky, do you consider yourself a hoarder? Not anymore. And also, everything I collected, except let's say comic books, mm -hmm. I used as money making machines. Can we call it that? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So you managed like the to, film collection. Well, you managed to turn your hoarding into a profession. Well, the <laughs> film collection generated money. Yeah. Yeah. Because you started. If I want to sell the posters or the original comic art, I can make a lot of money with it. Yeah. Well, I don't consider. So I don't consider that hoarding. I consider that. Yeah. I don't consider it hoarding because it's all over your walls. It's it's framed. Yeah, but you haven't seen the boxes of stuff that aren't. All oh well, okay. Yes. I haven't, gone, I haven't gone to the basement in a long time, is what you're you, saying. You no, but, you know, like the comic strip art, I've got box, archival boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff from the 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever. Yeah. Which, you, if I, I wanted to sell them or if I needed money, mm -hmm. well, I could do you make think a you very ever, good profit. Do you think you ever will sell it? No, eventually, <laughs> as I joke. My sister-in-law will throw it in a dumpster in the driveway. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, but, I'm, but here's the thing. My definition, I'm, I'm actively trying to manifest this to actually happen, is me coming to New York one day to hang out with Shecky and go through the basement and just open boxes and look at all the amazing things that are there because there's nothing quite like the experience of going through collections like that uh, where there's commonalities and, and just enjoying those things it has nothing to do with hoarding at that point. That's the experience. I love it. But that. you know, if I were to get rid of, let's say, my VHSs and my books, the house would not be all that cluttered. And it's not cluttered anyway. It's just I can't throw out books because that's just not the way I am. And the VHSs are always backups when the DVDs crap out. I don't think you're unusual with books. I think that most people. Uh, it, you know, once you read a book, you've read the book. You're probably never going to go back to it. No, but I don't also want to throw it in the garbage pile. But no, no. I mean, I'm sure Marjorie would not throw any of it away. You know, uh, today, you know, you can still <laughs> buy books. Uh, Marjorie, has, for years now, has been buying her stuff for her Kindle. So it's a different kind of collecting. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I'm looking up at my shelf right here, and I've got, I'm a big Stephen King fan. He released a series called the Dark Tower series. I've got like these first editions and they're all in these beautiful slip cases. I'm looking at them and they bring me so much joy, but they take up so much space. Like I don't have room in my house for them yet. And I'm trying to, that's one of the reasons I'm up here is-, is You know, like today, right before the show, I ordered a 900 page book that a friend of mine wrote about the Shadow Radio Show. <laughs> Do you know how much space that takes up? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Yeah, my my new rule is every book that comes in, one goes out. I just have to. I mean, as an English teacher for you know thirty seven years, the shelf there's just every inch is shelves. And, yeah, but I've you know, got a house have... and a garage, and you know, so I have space. Now, what, what about what about buying books on Kindle? Do, do you do that, or do you still? You buy know, it? I, I want I, it in my lap. I know. Sorry, but, yeah. right. I try it. I have a huge collection on my Kindle, and I always find myself. I do a few pages on the Kindle, and then I order yeah. the damn book. Cause I need, I need a pen. I need to read the book yeah, and turn the pages. Too. I've tried the Kindle. Yeah. You know the Kindle I use. If, you know when you can cruise or on an airplane. Right. The, right. the old days when you used to carry ten pounds of books in your luggage. Mm -hmm. that right. I don't do anymore. And it is amazing. It's almost anything in the public domain is free. So all these classic yeah. books, you can just load up for free, but it's not the same thing. Right. Yeah. I'm a big but, personal developer. I get all my personal development books on Kindle, but if it's anything that I fall in love with, the Kindle is almost the trial for me going and saying, okay, I want this book. 
and I'm going to go buy the physical copy. There's so many okay, books that I've my, my loved. Is, I, I, you know, I understand that Shecky doesn't like to read a book on his, on his iPad, okay? He likes that feeling that he's had all his life of holding a book in oh. his hand. Same thing with Steve Bender. But I don't understand why somebody would buy it on Kindle read the whole thing and then order the book that i don't understand i don't understand i think that's the sentimentality of a collector yeah I, the collector yeah. i've never i've never want. done that if I, I, if I, I, I know Kindle, that's it i'm done you know i'm not buying the book yeah i, I know or people who buy this i took out from the library mm -hmm. i know I people then order the sorry. book to add to the you know basement yeah I've been in offices where you, you see people with a hundred business books on the shelf and you walk over to one that you've read and say, what'd you think of this one? Oh, I, I haven't gotten around to reading that yet. Yeah. It's like learn through osmosis. You make pillows out of business books and sleep on them. But I'm, I'm in the middle of downsizing to get out of this big house to get into something smaller. And for the last month, I've been listing half of my stuff on, on eBay and Amazon and and selling off all of the things that I thought I needed. And the relief of it all disappearing is fantastic. It's a Charlie, big relief. Yeah, it's, Charlie, it's like- Charlie's it's got hard. a hand up. Yeah, when, when uh, I moved in with my ex four years ago, she made me get rid of all of my old college textbooks. And it was painful, but I did it. And now I wish I had. Why did she make you do that? Because, because I have so many books. But I then get like a store, then get a storage bookshelf. room somewhere. Down in Texas can't be that expensive. <laughs> or get your parents to give you your old bedroom back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be a trick. A trick. So my parents died 30 years ago. <laughs> well, shit. I mean, I used, it'd be a real achievement. Steve? I, I, I used to have close to, you know, 10,000 albums, vinyl albums in here, and enormous numbers of CDs, and I did a big purge and occasionally I regret it. And if I'm really in the mood for something I don't have, I can get it. I can I stream my, it. Uh, I, can you know, I had a big record collection because I was in the radio business and they gave me lots of records, right? And I, over the years, I threw away a lot of them, the ones that I didn't, didn't need, okay? Or that I didn't like or that didn't. In fact, I had a pile by my door of records I was going to throw out. And then when, trick, when the kids came around trick-or-treating, I would hand them like three albums. And they say, oh, great, LPs. And they would walk out the door. And then about five minutes later, I got a knock on the door. You got anything better? <laughs> <laughs> because they were all crap. But anyway, what happened was when, we, when I moved out to Cal New York this last time, Shecky knows because he traveled. Okay? We traveled out together in the car. Uh, uh, he, uh, I, um, I sold all my albums, most of my albums. I mean, the only things I didn't sell and that I still have are the comedy albums. Uh, and I sold all my old albums and they came, oh. I came in and repriced them all and everything. I made about 5,000 bucks. Yeah, but you also had two apartments in San Francisco. When you moved to New York, you had a one bedroom right. down on. Um, but, but I did put a lot of stuff in, uh, in storage. In storage. In yeah. storage. And uh, I could have put those in storage, but I decided to get rid of them because by that time, CDs were in, you know, and I, I, I knew what was valuable and I knew what wasn't valuable. I either kept the valuable stuff or I talked them up on a lot of the ones that were that really valuable. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, I had one thing I thought was going to make me a lot of money. He didn't even want it. I had a, a test pressing of, uh, of, uh, Kami by The Who, hmm. insert where they listed all the tracks that made on a mimeograph machine, remember those? And it said Tommy and opera. And then somebody had put a carrot in there and put in the word rock. Uh, and I thought that a test pressing of Tommy uh, would be really worth something. And the guy said, I can't even put a price on it. Said, I, but then today it might be worth something. Well, yeah. I still yeah. have it. So, you know. It, it's always the eye of the beholder. Um, I haven't sold very many of my collectibles, but I saw a me or a, a story not too long ago, and it was uh, one of those Facebook things that gets passed around. Mm -hmm. And it talked about this 
who had this old car that they inherited and and you know a junk tra a dealer offered them 500 somebody else offered them a thousand for it some of them said i'll charge you to take it away and then suddenly somebody who was a part of a corvette collector club showed up and offered them fifty thousand dollars us for it yeah. and it was a 1970 whatever stingray corvette that was still even in the shape that it was in worth you know when you find that right that right collection of people mm -hmm. what one man treasures and or uh, garbage is another man's treasure right well it's like ebay if you can get two guys into a pissing match over something you're trying to sell it doesn't go for 10 bucks it goes for 500 bucks yeah yep. exactly you know well you see that a lot with uh with letterman stuff you know i've been trying to collect some of the jackets and some of the things from from the show and sometimes every once in a while on ebay i'll find something nobody else sees it it goes under the radar and you know i get it really really cheap and sometimes things go for ungodly amounts yeah and it's just a goddamn jacket or t-shirt big deal mm, well you know uh shecky knows this little item um this is a postcard oh the john lennon thing from john lennon uh -huh. cool. oh my god uh, and you can see he, he signed it and, uh, it basically it reads, uh, just, um, was it a dream or did someone hand me a phone telling me I was on the air with Alex Bennett? Gee whiz. <laughs> Hope I was okay. I had enough shit last year. That's the, when he came back from California and he had gotten all that bad publicity for all the bad stuff he was doing with Harry Nilsson in California. What's the date on that, Alex? The date on this is, uh, yeah, 11th of March, 1975. Cool. That's a, yeah. That is unfucking believable. You know, the question yeah. is, and I asked Shecky one, how much is that worth? Okay. And, and Shecky got answered, but what, what? I've got insights into that. It's worth a lot. Well, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. But then you got to find the person at eBay or but Harry. What part, of a lot, whatever. what part of a lot is it? You know. Okay. So, and I, so, and I'm, well, I asked Shaggy once, how much is it worth? And he said, whatever you can get for it. Right. Yep. You know, that it's all a matter of how many people want it and who's... Supply and demand. Yes. And most of the people who want it are probably dead now. Right. No, I think it's worth a fair bit, but you know, it would be worth more if it wasn't a personal postcard to you, if it was a signed that's album. That's what I don't get, though. See, yeah. I mean, this is actually a piece of kind of, uh, even on John Lennon here, it, he adds the O. And so it'll be Len Lenono. Uh, and um, he, um, and this was a specific card made for a specific album, his rock and roll album. Okay. And it has some writing on the other side. It's a, basically it's a postcard. And uh, it's it's all handwritten with a little little uh, there's a little bit of artwork down here that he did of his caricature uh, and you know it's it, it, it's, but you say if it's personal it's not worth as much and I don't but it's a one true? of a kind is that true no so people don't want things with their like I when I used when I used to get like Western stars autographs. And I would say, did you do it to Rick? And they would give me a look like, are you sure? Right. And it's like, I don't want it if it's just going to say Gene Autry. Let's just say using a name. I mean, I, I collect signed books. And I know inscribed signed books are worth less than if they're just signed. Yeah. Why is that? I mean, yeah. the signature is a signature. Do you, want own, do you want to own a book that says to Steve? Yeah. If, if my name is No, Steve. people don't want. It <laughs> depends want on the said. author. It depends on the author. No, they just want one that says Charles Dickens, not to see I, I don't, best wishes, no. Charles Dickens. I would you know. think that something like this, which is far more personal, has a message on it, is more valuable it's than meaningless to 98% of them. Yeah, but the, ca the caveat is if it's written to a famous person, like, you know, that, that was written to, say, Letterman. So you have a, a, a card from John Lennon to David Letterman, who's also still very much in the culture. Card from John Lennon to Paul McCartney would be worth a fortune. Well, who? <laughs> who? In other words, <laughs> to Alex Bennett doesn't mean shit to a tree. Alex, who? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hold on. You know, the guy, yeah, also the, the the guy who was buying all, it almost, wants to be able to make believe John Lennon sent it to him or her. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's yes, true. Yes, yes uh, Mike. Okay, so here's the deal: how you monetize that thing. I got a buddy who owns a pretty large memorabilia store, and and there's a, a slice of collectors there. Whoever the famous person might be, a good example is ex presidents. So here's how you would monetize the John Lennon thing. There are companies out there who will buy letters, and I'm talking like the most mundane letters that a president or a celebrity has written somebody. They take that letter, they cut it up. Sometimes, depending on who it is, like Lincoln's a good example. He's got a piece uh, where it's Lincoln and it's literally one word, it's the word the. But then that company has taken, chopped off that letter and they have presented it. Here is actual pen to paper, Abraham Lincoln writing the word the, sold it for a thousand dollars US. So <laughs> what they do is they, they take pieces of, of uh, that, correspondence that, like that and wait, wait, do wait. that. That's how you'd monetize that. Isn't that terrible tearing up a letter? Yeah. 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 That's and destroying the whole letter? Just but to... there's a massive market for it. Hey, what about an unpaid invoice from a past president who doesn't pay his bills? Is that worth anything? <laughs> well, that, it, it will be one day. Uh, only, I've got one. Only right. if it isn't Trump. <laughs> no, that's what. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Trump I owe you will be worth. So it'll finally be worth something. No, if you go and because <laughs> it sure isn't worth it if you wrote it. I've but got an IOU. to a collector, I've got an IOU from Donald Trump. They'll go. Do you know how many of those there are on the market? Yeah. You know. Well, the fact is, an IOU written by him is worthless unless it becomes collectible. Then it has a value. Yeah, but so I never <laughs> put a value on this. I think Shecky at one time said you could get maybe upwards of twenty five thousand for it, something like that. And I, I. You but know, again, you still need to have a pissing match between two people. Yeah, two people really want it, and the price keeps going up and up and higher and higher. Um, Unless the company, company said, well, "Would you sell it?" And I said, "Absolutely." I said, "It holds no." Well, then call Heritage Auctions. Really? Like you remember when, um, what's his name? Um, our friend who died a year ago, um, the old guy, <laughs> sorry. Oh, but, uh, Jack Garfin. And he had yeah. all that stuff, and I was there when Heritage came over to look well, at it. There was some very classic stuff in there. And they just looked at it like, nobody wants this. And not they didn't call it crap. You know, that's not the way they deal. Well, you, you mentioned something to me that I think is interesting. When we talk in the relationship to John Lennon, okay? You find a kid here, you get a guy out there who's 20 years old, 25, 20. Don't even know who he is. I don't even know who John That's Lennon right. is. I know you find that impossible to, you know. I used to ask my students just on a lark, you know. These, these name are very, the four Beatles. The infamous very bright high school students named the four Beatles. Maybe one out of, you know, 50 could do it because their parents, you know, trained them. Did yeah, they forget the dung beetle? Huh? The dung beetle, the Japanese beetle, the... <laughs> They're in my uh, garden. Oh, look who's driving home. Hey, Mandy. Yeah. Uh, hey, lady. Um, hey, 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 no, oh. say hi since I've always, like, been in the meetings, like, in weird places with you guys. Did what you watch The Godfather? I did. Part what? two. Did yeah. you watch one first? No, I haven't watched one yet. Mandy. I know. It doesn't matter if they stand alone. All right. Yeah, well, you I, I have to it. watch one. What did you think? Oh, it was good. I just think that, like, during the scene where he was, like, in front of Congress, it was yeah. kind of like you had to know kind of the background about yeah. him basically killing people. So, you know, just yeah. kind of know that. Should have watched, watched one first. I, I guess I well, should have. Yeah. I we agree. Talk, I told her that too. Or watch yeah. the Godfather saga, the one that sticks yeah. part one in the middle of part no, one. We, well, they we do it chronologically. Yeah. I saw it. It's not that great. I think last week I mentioned that we had watched uh, the uh, the hitman's wife bodyguard, yeah. and then mm -hmm. all of you said, "Well, have you seen the first uh, film?" Yeah. So we went back and watched the first film, and I really wish we had watched that first. Mm -hmm. You didn't. You, you thought it was better than the than the second. Which right? film is that? I missed the first. The hitman's mm -hmm. hitman's uh, wife. I liked it. Bodyguard. Yeah. Yeah, and then the first one you liked even better. You know. So. Uh, I finally watched that Ted Lasso thing that everybody was talking about. Uh, I don't. I, I don't get it. It's I tried it's, to watch it's entertaining, but it's not. 
It's, it's it was great. fine. But this is not exactly the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, the yeah. old. I made Alex, it, what I did made... we last? 15 minutes? Yeah. I lasted about yeah, 20 minutes. Actual, I, I watched, I think, a whole episode. No, we Maybe. watched it together for 15 minutes. It yeah. actually gets better after the first episode, but you know, it doesn't say much. It was pleasant, but yeah. didn't alter my life. Yeah, I'm if you want an uh, ah shucks Kentucky moment, or, or Kansas moment, there's your, there's your show. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but the, anyway, getting back to collecting, I mean, the fact is that we said that John Lennon, a lot of kids who are 20, 25, don't really know who John Lennon was. I know we find that impossible to believe. But again, do you know who all these rappers are that they all think, you know, I mean, well, they don't know the one from two years ago because they're those guys are all disposable. Let me it's like pop music. Lennon still still looms pretty large. So I mean, like the Olympics, they started with Imagine. Right? People do oh. this stuff. Yeah, but that that yeah. that stop to bullshit. No, like oh, I, we're gonna play Imagine. Of course. Years years ago, like Armstrong. And let me let me add this: Who's the audience for the Olympics? Yeah, it's us old folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Years ago, Nirvana was on one of those acoustic things and they did a David Bowie song. I think it was Man Who Sold the World. Yes, yes. And then I saw a country guy do an acoustic version of it saying, I have to play this song because I just love Nirvana. <laughs> didn't, even, didn't even know that it was a cover that he was covering. <laughs> you know, but like Louis Armstrong, his fame is Hello, Dolly, and What a Wonderful World. Yeah. Oh, what about the 45, 50? Two years before those two songs, yeah. mm. when he was actually a damn good, oh, and he did "Hello Dolly" and he did "What a Wonderful World." That was at the time when the Louis 60s. Armstrong really wasn't doing what Louis Armstrong did best. Oh, you want to yeah, hear? That's, that's my point. You, you want know, to hear that's what you know? They would have opened the Olympics with "What a Wonderful World." Maybe they'll close it with that. <laughs> no, they're certainly not going to have the hot fives and sevens, right? No, exactly. it's, well, it's like Dock oh. of the Bay with. Uh, Hush, his name just went out of my head. Otis. Otis. Otis Redding. Yeah, the one song that sounds nothing like anything else his amazing voice ever did. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and that's what he's known for. He died five days later. Well, here's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask you, how many number one hits in his career did Frank Sinatra have? One. Well, you know that because I told you. <laughs> Frank who? <laughs> I was going to say, oh, Barry is one of those guys who's becoming lost to the annuals. But I mean, you talk about a gigantic uh, culture shifting star, but there's another one that's being forgotten as well, well. Well, but how many hits, number one hits did he have? And the answer Marjorie said is a spoiler was one. Which one was because it? he was making Which albums. One was it? Uh, that was with one his, his daughter. I layered the one with his daughter. daughter. Something stupid. Something stupid. Yeah. Something stupid. These were made for talking. But he was no, no tiny was Tim. Something stupid. <laughs> it was something, <laughs> yeah. something stupid. I have a great picture here, Alex. This is my dad getting ready to shake hands with Frank at the Circle Star Theater. Oh, wow. uh, you're not going to be able to see this because it's. You got to turn off your background. Let me turn off the background. How does one do that? Uh, choose virtual background. Uh, yeah, you, you turn this we're gonna off. find out he's in the bathroom. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. Oh, you've got uh -oh. Yeah. so that Frank, and this is my dad over here at the so on the this guy. So that's the last the guy in the row. You know, yeah, you know something. When when was that taken? Um, boy, I, probably in the eighties. In the 80s? I would think, yeah, at the Circle Star. I, I can tell you a great may, story think, about this. I think I may have been at that. I, I think you've said that before. Um, I have one interesting story about that. So before the show, my dad was there a little early, and yeah. he saw that that back door was open back there, I guess, to the to the backstage area. So he walked back there. There's nobody back there. It's a beautiful spray of flowers with a card in there from Frank's uh, um, uh, agent. So my dad took out the guy's card and he put his card in it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of people we are, you know. I mean, what I yeah, the fact that you know, I mean, um, I think I was. That was the show I was at. Probably, yeah. This has got to be eighties. I was supposed to meet Frank because the, the Dreesen, Tom Dreesen, is over. Right. 
uh, what I do. And he said, come on down and see Frank at the circus. And I'd never seen Frank perform. I'd been around Frank because my father worked with him at Cal Neva. Mm. But, uh, uh, and, and, you know, I've been sitting there with my father at the bar outside the, the, the uh, state line room, which was the big room they played in. And they would all come out, he and Sammy and so on, go into another room. So yeah. I, I, was, I was around him, but I never saw him perform. So I figured, well, I better go see him perform. Well, it's kind of like I didn't see Frank perform. I saw this thing that was left of Frank perform. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and once in a great while, it hit a note that wasn't bad, and the light was just right, and he was Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it was it was rather a rather sad. Well, yeah. that's because Barbara would send him out because she wanted the money. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I wrote, uh, I saw. Um, and uh, Frank Jr. was running the band. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I saw, I saw Milton Berle um, on People Are Talking. I don't know if you remember that show. I went and saw a taping one day. And he was Uncle Milty. I mean, as much as you could imagine. And then I happened to get in the elevator with him on the way down. And he was this little old man bent over. And he was a shell of himself. So he must, you know, they must prop him up, put him on stage for 15 minutes. Who you saying that was? Uh, Burl, Milton Burl. Milton Burl. But that was George Burns at Letterman. Backstage, there was this little shriveled old man. Yeah. And then when he walked through the doors, they they stand up straight. They become George. Came alive. They turn into yeah. George Burns. Yeah. yeah. And then when he gets off stage, like he goes when I'm back off into the... that little shriveled old man. At, yeah. I'm checking when I'm on not on here, uh, I I shrink down and then <laughs> <laughs> shrink it. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you know. Yeah. Is that true, Marjorie, the shrinkage? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the worst but one. all those performers at that period, you know, Bob Hope and stuff, same thing. Yeah. yeah. He's a little old man until he hits the stage. Yeah. Well, well, like, I, I have something I can play you here. Hold on a second. Yeah. There, there was a band in the in the late 80s called the Smithereens that I'd never seen and finally got tickets to go see them. Their lead singer had fallen down and hurt his arm. And while he was in recovery, he fell again. Oh, but when we went to see him, he had one arm in a sling and the other one was paralyzed. Oh, and his, a music stand sitting upright with drinks and straws. Mm -hmm. And the sound man was up on stage coming out, wiping the sweat off his brow in between songs. Uh -huh. It was, but he was thrilled. I mean, you could just see the joy in his face when he was singing. Yeah. And then about, yeah. about three or four months later, it, he, he passed away. So I got to see him That's before the end of that. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Let me just play it. Oh, sure. Okay. You have to be quiet because it's all on the same track as uh... Uh, same pot as uh, you guys, but listen here. He went to do a station promo. This is Bob Modern Rock Hope. Thank you. You're listening to Alex Whoa. Bob Modern Rock Hope, and you're listening to Alex Bennett on Alex Bennett. <laughs> 105. 105. Wow. Wow. Uh, that's my uh, big memory of Bob Hope. Wow. Was he out of it, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Wow. Um, you well, you, you, you watch those, those old uh, Bob Hope specials toward the end of his life. I mean, they were so edited. It was unbelievable. I mean, yeah. I don't think they got three words in a row between edits. <laughs> Well, how do they do those, Shaky? I'm trying to remember. We were talking about it one day, and you were talking about how they managed to piece them together in the later years. Uh, I don't I, remember I think, what I said. What but... I noticed, what I noticed was that on one of his specials, which he did on an aircraft carrier, mm -hmm. at uh -huh. the end of his life, he came out and told the jokes they were terrible, and there was a big, uh -huh. you know, there were big laughs from the crowd. Except if you looked at the crowd. They weren't laughing. <laughs> on the back of them, but they weren't going like this. They were just like this, you know. Well, it's like those old Dean Martin roasts where they oh, just God. stem together, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and they uh, cut in some audience reaction from, five, you know, like Lucy's mother's laughing. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell them about. Hear, I'll ask you about that in a second, but Mike has something. Well, no. If you want to hear a great story about Bob Hope um, uh, in, in his later years, um, David Letterman was on Conan's podcast. I don't know about a year ago, and they started trading 
Bob Hope stories, but from the view of Johnny Carson, because they both had a Johnny Carson anecdote about his perspective of Bob Hope. Because during those specials, Bob would come in and use Johnny's audience and his studio for his for his monologue. Yeah. And uh, Dave's got a story about, you know, meeting him and being served hot dogs. And Conan's got a story about when Bob Hope came in uh, as a voice actor on The Simpsons. And the story that he told... Uh, I think the punchline of the joke was put me down at that boat show. He was in a helicopter and, and they put him down in a boat show. And his impression of Bob Hope doing the lines for the Simpsons was almost exactly like the audio that you have. <laughs> it's like Alex, <laughs> Alex Bennett, it was almost exactly the same. And that, uh, I mean, no, that uh, it, phenomenal, Alex. I was, watching, I was watching an interview on an old Letterman show with uh, my, Peter LaSalle. Uh, who I believe went on to work with Letterman as well. And no, he came Carson, to us after was, Carson went off the after air. After Carson right. went off the air. But then when he died, you had him on. He was on the, that show, that tribute to Johnny show yeah. we did. Yeah. And uh, he said, uh, I think Dave said to him, why did he quit? And he said, he said he wanted to quit when he felt that he had stayed too long at the fair, you know? And he would always ask me, you know, is, is it time yet? You know, and I'd always, he said, he'd always say no. But finally one day, uh, uh, Johnny said, it's time. You know, mm. I, I don't want to overstay my welcome. And I think that's something that was any, any, I think he quoted the fact that, you know, Bob Hope didn't know when to, and a couple of others uh, didn't know when to, but he'd like to be remembered as he was. You know? mm not as this doddering old guy you know. jack jackie mason just died over the weekend and i didn't yeah, even know he was still alive i saw that my dad loved that guy my dad my dad worships jackie mason. Yeah. <laughs> does mandy in georgia know who jackie mason was no i seriously don't he's on mute you're on mute <laughs> I don't think I do. Okay. So please, come in. Yeah, she's, she's in her 50s. It was a Jewish comedian that played the... I mean, I, do, the we have dark hair? do we have dark hair? He had, yeah. he had orange hair as he got older. <laughs> I got and he talks so, like this. The game my, dad drag, is the my dad dragged me to his first Broadway show, and I actually thought I was going to have a heart attack. Yeah. I was, I, you know, it was where you're laughing to the point where... <laughs> He was a very funny comedian, but a terrible person. By all accounts, yeah. Uh, he did a voice on Simpsons as well, didn't he? he play uh, yeah, uh, Krusty's dad. He was Krusty the Clown's dad. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. remember him as I remember Bud Friedman telling me about him, how he literally was a gangster. That he tried to get money out of him wow. and, and stuff like that, and send gangsters in to get it. Supposedly Sinatra put hits out on Jackie Mason. Sinatra put what? hits out on Jackie Mason? Yeah, I was reading about that in a big piece about Jackie Mason just recently. Wow. I mean, just this week. Yeah, that Sinatra put well, a hit out on He put him. a hit out on, 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 on Jackie Mason. Why did Jackie Mason survive? Because I don't target. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know the old joke about Sinatra is, uh, Frank Sinatra saved my life. How's that? He said, that's enough. <laughs> you know, and Jackie Mason sued Ed Sullivan and actually won. Right, well, he was Why? Black. Why? Really? Because Why? according to Sullivan, Jackie Mason, while he was on stage, gave Sullivan the finger. Right. <laughs> according to Jackie Mason, he was getting the signals together. He was like, he was getting a signal from finger, he's doing this, he's doing that. Ed Sullivan got like a two second, supposedly a two sec, you know, a minute or whatever wrap it up signal and mason took that as and then he went you know hmm. you know well, why did he do him why did he, he that back and mason career, right he was blacklisted the finger? basically because of that yeah he was blacklisted oh he's blacklisted after that or yeah. to the point that people would not book him yeah i'm not gonna call well him he wasn't a very pleasant guy you know I mean, he had a couple of real successes and they kind of screwed them up by, by getting, doing something, you know, that pissed people off. And he was a rabbi. 
He had, he had a rabbi. He had a, yeah. whatever yeah. you call that. He was a father, rabbi. Grandfather, great grandfather, he, all rabbi. Yeah, he, he had a horrible sitcom back in the eighties that I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. British, some British woman that never would have given him the time of day yeah. with his the way, love I, interest. On YouTube last night, I watched one of the worst sitcoms I've ever seen. It was called uh, Daddy Dearest. Wow. Starring Richard Lewis. I and remember Ron it. Rickles. Oh, no. It was awful. <laughs> it was horrible. You know. <laughs> On paper, that should be awesome. On yeah. paper, it should be awesome. Yeah. But, you know, you can take two great people, two great comics. Hollywood. You don't up. write the words to come out of their mouths that are funny. It's yeah. Funny. Yeah. Rickles needs Rickles needs to do his own stuff. He he can't have. He can't well, do Rickles, you know. EO Sharky. I mean, he had that was okay. Those, you know, that was pretty really good. It was yeah. awful. Yeah, on yeah. Rickles' show, he had a, a variety of show. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, um, uh, you know, Rickles was a club comic. You yeah. Know, if I were, if I'm, if I were in show business today, I would never do any pilot or any demo that I didn't want to have come back to haunt me. Because now with YouTube, yeah. I, 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 last night I went looking for that show because I had seen just a clip of it. And there it was, two episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Alex, you ever meet the uh, Rickles? And uh, if you did, did he ever insult you? Did I ever meet Rickles? <laughs> I don't think I ever met Rickles. Uh, he used to drink in the office next to mine when he did the Letterman show. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah that's drink. where he would come upstairs to have his vodka on the road. Yeah, you know, I, never, I, mean, I never met Rickles. No. I mean, I mean, you know, Richard Lewis was a friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, 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 Rickles was a... Uh, it, 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 it had an interesting career, you know? I mean, his, his movie career was very strange because he made a lot of movies in the early days like uh, uh, oh, some American international pictures. And Late fifties, early sixties, he would do movies. Yeah, but I don't think he he knew what he wanted to do with his life. Particularly, he just was in show business and he, you know, promoted himself. But it wasn't. Was the he got what? Old. what? That for himself. What'd you say, Mike? Maybe you're breaking up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Was he looking to kind of blueprint what Jerry Lewis was doing, maybe a little bit? No. No. Oh. Okay. I don't think anybody wanted to be Jerry Lewis except what's his name? Um, Jerry Lewis. Uh, <laughs> no, what's his name? Um, yeah. Uh, 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 Mitchell and Mitchell and what's his name? They get, you know, the other guy looked like Jerry Lewis. What was his name? God, I knew his name all the time. Sammy Petrillo. Sammy Petrillo. Yeah. Sammy Pat anybody ever see Sammy Petrillo? No. Oh, this yeah. this guy was so good at imitating Jerry Lewis in a movie that when he went on the Today Show, when uh, uh, Lewis went, no, when Lewis went on the Today they Show, said, we found a rare clip of you, and they showed the clip, and he had to say, "That's not me. That's Sammy Petrillo." <laughs> And that's when Sammy knew he won. It's a film yeah. called uh, uh, Bill Bill the Ghost the Brooklyn the Gorilla. Brooklyn Gorilla. Jesus. Yeah. And if you go online, you can find it. I mean, it's uh, it's a classic. It is just horrid. They, they do that to me with George Clooney clips. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I can see that. Yeah. Hello to, yeah. Jeff. Hello to Jeff Stein, ladies and gentlemen, coming to us from Connecticut. Hello, yeah. Jeff. He's frozen. Yep. He's frozen. Frozen and muted. Yes. Um, this is making me cross sick. Talk loud. Yeah, Talk a little loud. Okay. This is making me cross sick to do this. Can oh, to do this is making you car sick? Because I'm like doing this. Yeah. We'll talk right. to you later. Okay. We'll talk to you later. Okay. I'm, I'm like in South Georgia. I know because I get uh, I get car sick if I'm trying to look at something. Kisses. Yeah. In the front see seat you of the next car. Time. Yeah, I'll see you next week. Okay. Next we you're throwing bye -bye. up at, at your family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye, Mandy. Good having you. Uh, okay. Bye. Wow. Yeah. I can't read in the car. I'll, I'll get I, I, I can't either. Uh, I, I, I'm, better, I'm better in the back seat. I, I can read in the back seat. It's the front seat I can't. I don't know. I bet you back huh? seat, buddy. What? 
I said, I bet you are better in the back seat. Yeah, I'm better in the back seat. Yeah. Uh, Steve Bender, you weren't here last week. Wait, you I, have know, I, to do? I felt horrible. I totally spaced out. I had talked to Mike earlier in the day. He said, I'll see you later. Uh huh. Then I looked at my clock and it was 10 after five. I was like, damn, you know, so. Oh, okay. Because I wondered where you were because you well, were very good at it. Time and space has been very uh, malleable of late. What do all you think about the fact, I'm, I'm getting a little, for instance, we have to go to court on, on Friday and I'm thinking about not doing it because I don't think it's safe out there now. Hmm. Even if you've been vaccinated. I'm going. Well, then yeah. wear your Harlem cap. My <laughs> <laughs> <Wear> Harlem cap. <laughs> if you're worried, wear a mask. But yeah, I mean, I just, um, I, I don't know. I just don't, I, I'm not that, that, I don't feel that safe after the stuff they're saying now, you know? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still waiting to hear what this Lambda variant is. Yeah. yeah. Lambda variant? Is it yeah. really a Lambda variant? Yeah. yeah. Everything, everything I've read is not as aggressive as Delta. Yeah, I don't. Right. Wow. What are you doing You're running out of Greek letters? <laughs> we'll use we'll use Hebrew and piss off the white supremacists. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, I, the high variant. Uh, maybe maybe the, Arabic just to be Sanskrit. Yeah. But I mean, it. Um, I, I don't know. I just I just uh, you know. I'm, you just don't want to go there, Alex. Well, that's that's also true. You know. I mean, you know, we, and deal with what's going to be a wait. I don't want to say it this way, but a waste of your time, probably. Yeah, absolutely, a waste of my time. Hey, can I, but I know. can I get a sampling from the room here? My wife showed me an article that the people in this resurgence that's happening, the majority of them are the ones who haven't had their two vaccinations. Is that how you all understand as well? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Is that, okay. You mean the yeah. people that are getting it that have had one shot and have, uh, are getting it and have had the or, shot when they well, have one no, shot? The number, no, the, the other number quote, unvaccinated people are the ones. Has, oh, yeah. They're, 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 yeah. But they're the ones. They're like 98% of those that arrive in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. hospitalized and dying are those. Other people are getting are getting hot testing positive, but the they're fine. Vaccinated. Yeah. Because they're not jackets. Fully vaccinated people are getting it. They're not getting incredibly yes, sick. That's, okay. Yeah. I'm seeing people this week on, and I'm seeing this week on Facebook, my idiot right right wing friends starting to post that they've decided now that we see that it's safe. I it's it's we're, we we let all of you libs get uh, be be our test rats. Now we can get the vaccine because well, you didn't. Uh, that's their excuse to make up for the fact that they were well, just being idiots. These Republicans are suddenly going out there and saying. You maybe should, we think you should get it. Oh, really? You waited this long. How many people well, they did, they did because polling they didn't say and found that? out that people won't vote for them if they continue saying don't get vaccinated? Yeah, so they got to change their message. I guess it's against the American way of being to just make it a law that you have to have the vaccination. Well, isn't there maybe I'm wrong, but isn't there kind of a law that you have to wear pants if you leave the house? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I don't know if it's an actual law, but you know, why do you? Decent, why, I mean, there is a decent exposure, I guess. I think it's too late to be telling me that, Rick. <laughs> well, Damn it! <laughs> no shoes, no pants, no service. Well, well, at what point is it illegal to endanger other people with your behavior? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's what it boils down to. And, and I, I just can't, you know, can't imagine what's going to happen the day that we have a virus. That kills you within the hour, and you know, yeah. some like an Ebola, and, and don't tell me I, I can't. I have to be vaccinated. Yeah. Or the Black Plague did that to people back in yeah. the 16th, yeah. 15th century. You know, in the morning they were fine, and by nightfall, dead. Dead. Yeah. Well, a year and two months ago, we're thinking, oh my God, is this the Spanish flu again? Right. Same thing. And it could have been. It could have been, and it wasn't. Thank God. Well, that right. was. That was the problem. All of these these people wanting to build border walls. They heard it was Spanish and said, ah, we can deal with that. Well, you know, Spanish, <laughs> flu, Spanish flu, if it were to happen today, would not be dangerous because oh, we have the antibiotics and everything else. We have the, 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 uh, the means to take care of it. This was a whole different thing. This was a whole new super bug. And, yeah. And, the uh, result could have been the same, though. 
No, oh, but yeah. I mean, but the the impact. Uh, I I think. How many people died of the Spanish flu? Wasn't it 50 million? Somewhere? Oh, a hell of a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, it's 50 million, I think. Worldwide, um, yeah. Yeah, but we didn't have antibiotics. We didn't have, we didn't even have intubation and things like that, you know? You know, and the soldiers brought it back when they were yeah. mustered out after World War I. Well, actually, it started... It started on. A, oh, is it, in, it was in the army base, like in Kansas, Kansas. City. Or yeah, it, the, for the whole world, it, that's where it started. Then we sent soldiers over there, and it started to spread. And the only thing there was a pause. I think in the Second World War that they took because the Spanish flu was so pervasive and people were dying that they just said, oh, "Wait a minute, we're not going to have our war right now." <laughs> we'll, Did, we'll be back after these messages yeah am i right about that they they, yeah, but, they kind of said well we're putting a hold on the war for a couple of months here while we right because we don't want to kill you when you're sick exactly <laughs> it, it's like a lethal injection when they what use the alcohol swab before they they give yeah. you the injection I was they want to send you to hell with an infection. Well, initially, that was my big joke. Do they give you a, a you know, an alcohol swab before they put insert the needle? It was an old, was an old George I Carlin routine. Somebody, and they said, yes, they do. Yep. It's a George Carlin routine I stole. <laughs> no, but they do. And yep. that's the silly part of that. Yeah. yeah. By the way, did you guys see the John Oliver about uh, the history of uh, what the, 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 the backup mindset for... House. For uh, reparations, yeah. yeah, it was brilliantly I've, I've, done. If you get a chance to see John week? Oliver, was that this last week? Just now, yeah, it was on last night. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's oh, funny, yeah. Tricky and I, when I was out there, we talked about reparations, didn't we? Wasn't that part of our yeah. little discussion? Yeah. You know, I don't know. I really we're, don't know what the solution is, but or something, you know. Well, I, I, you know, I don't think you can go back and give reparations for slavery. I think it's it's too far gone, and. Uh, you know, uh, is it be just because you're black that you'll get it, or did you have to have yeah. grandparents? <laughs> well, if, if you look, watch the story, and when next time we meet, talk about it because he really makes a case that I'd never thought of, in terms of you know the the, oh, the, the, the house of the housing act in the '60s. Oh, but he said are, there should be reparations for that action. That yes, yeah, it should be. It should be a descendant of. That discrimination that truly prevented and a population I'm with a certain that, skin tone from getting ahead in this. For that, a hundred percent, because yeah. it was discrimination that was done against black people when they tried to buy homes. And uh, today, if they'd bought, been able to buy a home and they held on to that home, they probably would have bought it for eight thousand dollars, and today it'd be worth about three hundred thousand. It's way. It's still going on out here in, in Oakland. Somebody had a house appraised. Um, and it's a black family. The appraiser was white. Um, the appraisal came in very low. They had it reappraised by somebody. They made a big stink about it. There was a $400,000 difference between the low appraisal and the high appraisal right. because there was obviously but discrimination. If you're about reparations for that, that particular action, I'm all for it. You know. Yeah, but it was, if, if you watch the show, I don't want to. Charlie, I don't, did you try to buy a house in the last 30 years? We thought. <laughs> 30 years ago i did yeah yeah uh -huh. did you have any trouble getting a loan and stuff no i, I didn't uh oh, well no 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 reparations for you then. <laughs> no but alex like you've talked about your court case where the judge and these people are enamored that the fellow was a basketball player yeah uh -huh. yeah 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 wow he played basketball <laughs> barely Barely, yes. You know, we're not talking about Lou Alcindor yeah. here or Will yeah. Chamberlain. Or I had to point. Yeah. I had to point out to the judge that uh, I was in radio. He said, "Well, where did you work?" And I went Sirius XM and WMCA and blah blah blah. And he seemed a little bit uh, in in awe of that, but not like the basketball player. The guy who was number twelve on a. Team of twelve on the Knicks. Uh, team of he <laughs> only lasted two years and then went to play in Italy. Well, he played on the Nets for a year or two and then went to Europe. Yeah, but anyway, the point is, that, yeah, the, yeah. So, well, well, I don't, I don't think he could get reparations. Okay, you know. Well, he was discriminated against. 
No, I see. That's my <laughs> The white Jew discriminated against him. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah I just, I think you got to watch it and then, and then talk, have the conversation because it's really interesting how he laid it out. It, uh, I mean, the discriminate the, the, the case that, that Len just said, they have an example on there of a woman who hired, she rented a white guy to pretend that that was his house. And the appraisal came back a couple hundred thousand dollars higher. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it, it, absolutely. Uh, he was very bright in his assertion. I mean, because he, he was talking about reparations, but then he separated into, well, there should be reparations for this. Yes. So, yes. And that I had to agree with. Yep. That's my, that's my point I was making. Yep. Yeah, we can't have all those cooties. God, I'll be glad when he gets back into the studio, though. You don't like the void? <laughs> well, I know. Here's the problem. I, I think he needs the audience. He's a con- Five weeks. Huh? Five, Five weeks. weeks. Yeah. Um, uh, you know. How do you to that show, for sure? What? The energy of the audience adds a lot to that show. Well, it, no, you know what it does? It adds to his timing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Tells a joke, people laugh, you pause, next joke, right? But there's a there's a pause. Here, he's just rambling, and he's almost doing it at too rapid of a speed. And he has nothing there, nobody there to tell him, this is really funny, you know, and let it play that way. So it'll be good to have him back with the audience. I think he needs an audience. I think he's been very good without it. He's been without it, he said, for a year and a half. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's hard to I'll watch Colbert. Huh? You can see how grateful Colbert is to have that audience. Like he is. Just, oh yeah. Like it's a completely different deal. I, 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 my hat goes off to John Oliver for. How what do you mean it's a completely different deal? I think Colbert's not funny in either. Oh. Well, either way, <laughs> but I'm is his perspective as a performer, uh, having the audience versus not having the audience is completely. But I have to tell you something about Colbert. Colbert was not a stand-up comic. So having that audience there is not as much juice for him as for John Oliver. I disagree. He, he's just to playing to an audience. You know? Yeah, but as an improv actor, he was doing the same thing. It was just a different, uh, it was a different presentation. But John Oliver was still a big part. Yeah. I remember when Letterman did a show without an audience, but that was the night of the hurricane, right? The hurricane. Yeah. Oh, by the way, it was Denzel Washington. Remember the other day I couldn't remember who the guest was? Yeah, yeah. It was Denzel Washington. Funny because didn't Denzel was in the movie The Hurricane? He played. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie, did you the one with uh, out an audience when there was a huge cold snap too? No. No? Okay. No, it was only The Hurricane Night. Yeah. And then there was one show he did in the uh, lobby. Oh, well, was the, well. Then we also did the four AM show, you know, things like. But we had full audience. Yeah. 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 Did you do a show that night when you did the four AM show? No, that aired that night. In, in other words, when did you shoot it? Four in the morning. Four in the morning. And so it went out live. It went out live. No. What do you mean? No, we taped it at 4 a.m. and it aired at 11:35 that oh, night. Oh, okay. They didn't. They didn't go out live at the same time. No. Oh, okay. That would have been fun. That would have made it really a four o'clock in the morning show. You know. It was a great it was a show. Crap, it was a crappy show. Yeah. Really? I thought Harris was hysterical. Oh, it it was what's her name wandering around Greenwich Village, going into gay bars or whatever the hell she was doing. You know, um. What was the name of the woman? Very funny. Amy Sedaris. Yeah. 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 And yeah. the ride along with the cops was funny. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Okay. okay. Well, I didn't. Hey, listen. <laughs> oh no, we got a minute. Um, that, you know, I was uh, I was going to say that I, um, I also am watching endless stupid pet tricks, but the best ones have to be the two talking dogs. I showed them to Marjorie, and she was. The one that said, I love you? Yes, I love you. Yeah, I love you one, yeah. And then, but the the other one was, who's the president of the United States? And the dog said, Obama. It wasn't as good as the one that said, I love you. Well, it's a little harder to say Obama than I love. Three words. Huh? Well, you know how difficult it is for me to say, I love you. So, I mean, how... (laughs) 
They both have three syllables. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, everybody. It's been good having you here. First of all, thanks to Mandy for joining in and, and Jeff for freezing. I don't know what happened to him. Uh, Shecky, always good having Shecky here. Andrew, good having you here. Steve, Charlie Wallace, Lynn LaFrisco, Mike Chisholm, uh, Marjorie. And, uh, you know, what I love about this show is how much do we talk politics? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. That was a fast hour. <laughs> it was a fast hour, too. Uh, yeah. You know. But anyway, everybody, thanks so much for having joined me. And uh, I didn't know I was falling apart, but thank you for <laughs> And I'll uh, I'll see you all next week, okay? Thanks, Alex. Bye, everyone. Let me see here. Let me stop recording.